Becky Lennon. Uh, I'm I'm Erica Gillespie. I am uh, the princ a principal in the Waterloo Region District School Board, and I'm joined tonight by Jennifer Vieira, a principal at Dufferin Peel Catholic, and Lisa Cole, who works for York University's K2I Academy, and she's our resident expert in science here tonight. And we are here to present to you uh, the webinar, STEM, One Way to Change the World, with a focus on engaging students in social and environmental justice. And this is a repeat of our webinar in September with some add-ons for some new resources that have become available uh, since we presented it at that time. Uh, note that this webinar is a collaboration with OPC, CPCO, and ADFO. Uh, and there is a similar presentation happening in French for French administrators supported through funding through the Ministry of Education. Uh, I'd like to wake, welcome our uh, sign language interpreters here tonight. Uh, for us, and also Brad Harris, our tech and organizational support through the process. Before we begin, I wanted to take this opportunity for my to give a territorial acknowledgement. Uh, I am currently working in Kitchener Waterloo, but the work on this project for me anyway, was done at where my home uh, in southwestern Ontario, and I would like to use uh, that area as my territorial acknowledgement tonight uh, in an act of truth telling uh, and a way of recognizing the unceded territory that I occupy. So an interesting story that um, history that uh, Caldwell First Nations uh, in the Point Pelee area were settled in that area before 1763. However, when European settlers arrived, there was a treaty negotiated, and that treaty was with the Anishinaabe and without the consent of the Caldwell First Nations people or its chief. Uh, during the War of 1812, uh, the Caldwell First Nations fought alongside their British allies and were promised title to their land for that support. However, that promise was not granted and colonialization displaced those people from the Point Pelee area and designated it a national park in 1918. Uh, they were forcibly displaced by the RCMP in 1922 when they tried to reclaim that traditional homeland and have only very recently, November 2020, been recognized as a uh, federally recognized as abandoned southwestern Ontario and without a reserve land of their own until just recently when they started uh, to be given the ability to um, form an urban reserve in the Leamington area. So I offer that as an act of truth telling and reconciliation. I think it's important that those kind of stories are heard. So tonight's webinar is focusing on uh, three, four topics. We are going to be talking to you about what is new about the new curriculum, why we need to change, why this change is required and really important, what skills teachers might need uh, that you would be needing to support as their leader, and then uh, as that leader in the building, how can we work together to support this? So, Slide four, this is what's new. This is the vision of science education in the document. If you just take a second to read this document, and if there is a word that stands out to you when you're reading this, if you could just plop that in the chat. Thank you, Sue. So I see transferable, very big topic in this curriculum, being able to go through cross-curricularly and transfer skills, really important in that changing world. And Luciana had written changing, absolutely. I think we're all seeing how things in science are changing at such a rapid pace. Uh, it's really important that we are keeping up with that. Um, and the modernization of, the, of a curriculum, really important in light of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vita, rapidly as well. It is certainly very, very fast. Okay, so one of the things that uh, is available for you as an administrator and to share with your teachers, very important if you have not shared this already, would be the overview chart. The link is on the slide deck there, but you can find that in the science curriculum webpage. There is an, thank you, Lisa, for putting that in the chat. Uh, that overview chart, really helps your teachers to see what's different. So sometimes, you know, we just go along and we're teaching what we've always taught in science, 
this really helps to highlight what's different, what is still there, what can they keep, uh, but what do they need to maybe change, adapt, modify, modernize some of those words that we read in that vision statement um, to be able to ensure that they're meeting the demands of the new curriculum. In most areas, the changes are tweaks to the curriculum, but those tweaks can have a really big impact. Uh, and I think that this puts it in a manageable way in a chart. Uh, so what are the biggest challenges or changes that we need to be aware of? These would be the highlights here. Uh, there's a whole new strand in the new curriculum. If you're not aware of that, uh, that's one of the biggest things that teachers need to be aware of. In the past, we used STEM as sometimes a, a club or a field trip, or maybe uh, you would invite someone into your classroom for the day to do a workshop on STEM. This is now a concrete, intentional part of the curriculum, and it's first. It's meant to be the focus. So really that change in perspective to STEM skills and connections has to be up there uh, right at the top. Um, just like our math curriculum, coding is now included in the science curriculum. And there's a focus on engineering design process. So this is sort of a, a move, an extension from technological problem solving into the engineer design process. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the focus of how we teach is shifting. So that focus on curiosity and wonder, critical thinking, discovery learning, all the things that we know are best for student learning are in there. Uh, Cross-curricular approaches to real world problems. And that's really the concept of this um, webinar tonight, that social justice, environmental justice piece. Uh, and so that kind of relates to the next point around um, global issues, how science, technology, coding, and engineering can tackle the issues that we see in the world and really make the world a better place, a positive change. Uh, there is a real specific and pointed connection to climate change, uh, liter food literacy, uh, focus on skilled trades that's incorporated into the curriculum that wasn't there in, in that uh, aspect before, and of course, an equity focus. And Lisa is going to take over this one in a second, but we're really looking at the inclusion of human rights and equity, Indigenous education, supporting our English language learners, and special education supports for students in the new curriculum as well. And I'll pass it over to Lisa. Thank you, Erica. So why change? What's you know what what's really important about our work in in implementing this new curriculum and you know oftentimes um you know we start this conversation by saying where's the data where is the need and so i'd like to start with some numbers um and some of them you may know of and others uh, you may not have had a chance to 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 see them but in canada uh, only 17.9 percent of licensed engineers are women there is less than 5% women representation in many trades, including automotive service technician, electrician, and carpentry. And only 24.2% uh, of enrollments in current accredited engineering programs in Canada um, are, are women, uh, with the highest proportions in particular disciplines, including biosystems, chemical engineering, and geological engineering. Only 0.6% of undergraduate students enrolled in engineering programs in Canada identify as Indigenous peoples. According to the 2016 census, only 71,365 Black Canadians 25 years and older had a post-secondary certificate diploma or degree in STEM. Um, the Canadian population of 25 plus years is approximately 25 million. So in fact, 94% uh, of Black uh, youth in Canada said that they would like to get a bachelor's degree or higher, but only 60% thought that they could. Uh, we know that um, scholars like Dr. Carl James at York University have, have done studies specifically to uh, the Toronto District School Board and found that only 53% of Black students were in academic programs in TDSB. Uh, compared to 81% of white students and 80% of other racialized students. 
So we know that this pipeline is often re referred to as being leaky, that students kind of fall out of these pathways and, and they fall out at early stages along that pathway. But I would argue that, you know, this pipeline is not only passively leaky, but rather there are filters and pumps that actually push certain students out. And that without a, a curriculum that uh, engages youth early on, starting from kindergarten, grade one, all the way through to build potential skills, to, to provide early exposure to some of these concepts early, then we perpetuate this leakiness or the or the or the pushing out of students. So we know that now uh, the grade nine science curriculum is also de-streamed. And we're hoping to change this narrative for students and families. Our current pathway. Uh, includes ele elementary to secondary to skilled trades and apprenticeship programs, college, university, and the place of work. There are many options. And oftentimes, students are left to navigate this complex system, trying to move towards uh, a goal that they wish to pursue. I guess the question for us as, educat as educators and leaders is to think about how we need to provide opportunities for students so that they can make informed decisions, that it's not by chance, that it's because they have had the early exposure and learning to make informed decisions about who they wish to become, what their interests are, and be successful on the pathways that they choose. So I, I want to actually uh, share with you um, something that we have been doing here at K2I Academy at Lausanne School of Engineering. We've been really focused on ensuring that the programs that we develop has equity, diversity, and inclusion in mind. And um, we're I'm sharing with you today a framework that we developed to not only think about our current programs to assess them and find ways of making enhancements, but also to think about future work and how we design programs that are more equitable and inclusive in nature. You will see that if you open up the document, um, it's a framework grounded in critical theory, anti-oppression theory and anti-racism education. It pushes us to think about the individual, instructional and institutional responsibilities that each of us have to co-develop and co-implement inclusive experiences for all our students. The document includes some questions for, for you to consider as you think about designing and implementing programs through an operational framework, including three levels, organizational, program, and sessional. We are transparently sharing how we operate here at K2I in thinking about designing programs that support schools, educators, uh, in the K to 12 space, but also student experiences in the undergraduate space here at Lausanne. We know as leaders that one single initiative isn't going to create the full solutions we need in our system. However, we can start to build a culture and a suite of initiatives that gets us moving forward, each addressing different aspects of the larger problem. I am often reminded of my time in the classroom when I say this as a physics teacher. As a, as a physics teacher, I used to have tools in my classroom to fix things, duct tape, screwdrivers, hammers, and often fixing things so that the activities will run smoothly. So I often wonder about these tools that we use to fix our larger uh, system in education. How much duct tape? What duct tape? What tools are we going to use to plug up those leaks in our in our system? So in the chat, I'm going to just uh, place um, uh, some information as follow up uh, that you can grab as well um, uh, based on that work. The first rule of designing with inclusion and equity in mind is to make sure that we're designing for students with students. And in order for us to do that, we need to ask students, what are they interested in? So at K2I, we have been asking youth, what problems do they want to tackle 
in the world. And these are some of the responses that they have shared with us. And if you take a close look at all of these challenges, you know, if we addressed all of them, I think our world would be a better place. And, and so the question for us as educational leaders is to make connections between this science and technology curriculum to the problems and interests, uh, the problems that students want to solve and, the, and their interests in these topics. So when I think about these real world problems that the students have identified, um, they are intrinsically connected to social and environmental justice topics. And, you know, I would say that a great starting point for having these conversations is around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So um, much of our programs that we have been creating where I am connects to these uh, global challenges. I also want to suggest here that um, there are great innovators, great scientists, engineers, mathematicians, STEM professionals, all in Ontario and across Canada. And I would say that though it is important for us to go back in history and profile the stories of role models that were never spoken about in our science textbook to set the narrative right, it is also important to think of, uh, to share and find the stories of innovators that are present today doing this work. So I want to just profile this one researcher I work with on a regular basis, Dr. Solomon Boyaki Yira. He is an assistant professor at, in mechanical engineering. And when I say mechanical engineering, likely you thought of cars, machines, engines, airplanes. But I'm going to tell you that uh, Solomon design, actually designs new materials and then studies how they behave when you actually smash things up. And what's exciting about his, the, the work that he does is that it has many applications, applications from transportation, including airplanes and cars, but also biomaterials. He uses 3D printing technology and emerging tech to design new materials to test for medical technology applications, studies concussions, and creates new materials for medical implant technologies. And the other cool factor about Solomon is that he's been on, that, on National Geographic's Colossal Machines, um, speaking about some of the work that he does. So I share Solomon's profile here, here with you intentionally. If you asked your students and your teachers in your buildings to name or draw a scientist, engineer, computer scientist, or an electrician, who would they identify? Would they imagine themselves in those roles as possibilities? Why or why not? And I think these are the questions that drives our work where I am. So creating opportunities for students to see science, technology, engineering, coding, mathematics, and all the skills and tools that are available to be creators and innovators um, needs to resonate with them personally. And so I, so I often think about the different places of work that students may imagine themselves wanting to be in. So I think of healthcare, medicine, well-being, mental health, I think of the environment, climate change and, and action, and I think about all of the different places of work that currently careers are, are in. And I think about the ways that STEM professionals have, have impacted that place of work. You know, when we think about, you know, students saying they want to be a vet or a doctor, we often refer to the person, the vet or the doctor. We don't think about the technologies we need, you know, the x-ray machine, the MRI, the lab technician that is doing all of the tests to make sure that uh, things, are, things are well. So I think we need to broaden what we provide exposure to our students and teachers uh, with so that they could share this narrative that there is a place for all people in STEM doing a wide variety of jobs and careers, that it's an exciting space that has made great impact on both the, uh, our society and, and the environment, both good and bad. Because I think we also forget that not all technology has been great and that we need critical thinkers and problem solvers to question how we design future tech, 
how we make ethical decisions around uh, what we study. And I think about our, our new you know, mission to the moon, our lunar uh, mission that the Canadian Space Agency is involved in. And I think about what it means to colonize space. And I think about all of the questions that we need to be tackling with our students to inspire, to provoke thought, to excite them at the possibilities of how they might uh, take, uh, take up uh, some of these problems in their own careers. So um, one final thought I'd like to share is that, you know, post-secondary, we're also thinking about changing up what we do and what we offer in uh, post-secondary education. We know that sitting in lecture halls, it's not very engaging. We've all been in that space. So we know that there is much work for us to do um, in post-secondary to also reimagine a future um, post-secondary experience. So I'm sharing with you a link to an article. Um, our dean is uh, it's launching this fall, 2023. It's a fully work integrated uh, degree where you where students earn a salary while earning an undergraduate degree at the same time. It's an exciting program. Students get pay, uh, only take courses for 20% of their time. So we're really disrupting what we're thinking about in terms of post-secondary education. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Erica. Thanks, Lisa. So now that we've had some conversation about the why of this change in the curriculum, we need to start to think about the how. Uh, sometimes when we hear that there's a new curriculum, it can seem a bit overwhelming. And one of the things that I like to do is to think about how I can connect it to things I'm already doing. And I think it's really important that for our teachers that we make these connections to support them in their work of adapting to the new curriculum. Uh, here are a couple things that we talked about about as a group and thought about right away that we wanted to share with you to think about. Uh, coding is one, for sure. We've been doing a lot of work already with coding in the mathematics curriculum. And what a great, great way for teachers to be able to cross-curricularly support math and science together through the lens of coding. Uh, the One of the concerns that I've heard in my school from our junior and intermediate teachers is the learning through doing over worksheets or reading, viewing uh, those kind of activities in science, particularly by teachers who maybe are not as confident with their science background as they might be in some other subjects. This is an opportunity, I think, for us to connect those areas of our school with our primary division. When we look at what's been happening with full day kindergarten over the last several years and that focus on provocations, um, uh, those kind of things, I think that that is a really great way for us to support that. Uh, safety considerations, that always comes up. We have had conversations in the past about safety and warning people away from certain activities. We wanna make sure that uh, we support teachers with feeling comfortable that students can be safe. The link uh, in the slide deck goes to the Steo store, which has a book that I've purchased for my staff. It's only, I think, $15. It has some really great uh, outlines in there for what is okay, uh, things like ethical considerations, you know, can you use a candle to demonstrate heat, uh, all of those sorts of things that teachers might come up upon when they're looking at that learning by doing, and they might have some safety considerations. Uh, similar to what we have in Phys Ed, our OFIA guidelines that help teachers to understand what they can do safely and what should be avoided. Um, our fourth one here is looking at contributions to science and technology. Uh, you know, it, I think that's part of the work that we've been doing in all areas to learn about diversity in and the equity component. Uh, we need to make sure that when we talk to students about scientists, we're not just talking about Einstein. Uh, we're talking about a, a wide variety of uh, people, genders, um, all kinds of backgrounds and worldviews that are coming in. And then we need to look at, um, can we connect things like community speakers, virtual events, uh, what current 
different events are happening in the world that might be connected. These are places to start where we start to get students to engage and think about those connections to practical solutions that will have real meaning to students and really be connected to that environmental and social change piece that Lisa was discussing is so important, uh, not just now in our elementary curriculum, but throughout their career and education and beyond. A number of new resources have been developed to support teachers in this work. So uh, right on the curriculum, science and curriculum document site, you'll notice that there are long range plans available. And the thing I like about those long range plans is you can see a screenshot example here. They not only connect to the long range plans, uh, the science curriculum, but there are connections to visual arts, language, math. So it helps us to make those connections for students and be able to identify where they can pull in in a cross-curricular way. Uh, STEO has those long-range plans listed on their website as well and lesson plans connected to that. So if you uh, go onto the site, thanks Brad for showing us that link there. There are uh, lessons that can be one to three periods. They include the curriculum expectations, success criteria, wow. what resources. They're really well designed and easy to follow. And they really make those equity, diversity, and inclusivity considerations apparent so that teachers uh, are able to support all learners in the classroom. And there's a really strong focus on that strand A, the STEM strand uh, in the work. So if that's something that's a little bit newer to teachers or they're a little bit less comfortable with, it really brings it in there in a meaningful way. And uh, that again, connecting through the long range plans to other strands, to other curriculum and subject areas uh, is apparent and obvious in there. And something that I really encourage my teachers to do, even from the assessment and evaluation perspective, how can we connect them through the different curriculum areas? And uh, in my school, we call it work smarter, not harder when we're going uh, to do this work in our classroom. And then long Last but not least, the ministry uh, ran some seminars, some webinars themselves in the fall directed at teachers uh, that they uh, I attended a couple of these and I know our further presenters did as well. And some really good information there to help teachers really understand from uh, that educational perspective, how we approach this. Those are linked uh, right here on that the link on this page that I think Lisa just put in the chat and teachers are available to watch them at any time. And the presentation files, the slide decks are to be posted. I do not believe they're on the website yet. It says January, 2023 in there, but uh, coming very soon. So those are some resources that you could easily share tomorrow with teachers, if you haven't already, uh, to help them to get on the path of making sure that their curriculum is matching the curriculum documents that are currently in place. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to dig a, us a little deeper into the how. Yeah, and it's uh, it's going to be me. I'm Jennifer. Thanks for passing that off, Eric. Uh, we're so just sorry, gonna, Jennifer. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. We're going to spend uh, just a little bit of time uh, taking a little bit of a leadership lens and take a look at how um, we as principals can facilitate this professional learning for our teachers and what are some things that we need to think about uh, as we move along. So right now we're in the month of February, so we're kind of midpoint through our school year. Um, so everyone may be at a different place. So we're going to do a little bit of a temperature check check uh, together, thinking about your own school and your own staff. We're going to go through some reflection questions, and we will have an opportunity to move into breakout group to do a little bit more focused uh, uh, work and uh, have some uh, focused conversations in some particular focus areas. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, afterwards. So let's start off by thinking about uh, our own school right now. So where are our teachers currently? And it's really important in doing this work that we get to know where our teachers are. And I know that we all do this in a variety of ways, whether it be through um, dialogue and uh, formally or informal conversations in the hallway. You may be perhaps collecting some survey information from your staff, engaging in some talks at your staff meetings. Um, some of the ways that we can figure out kind of where our teachers are. Um, where, what are our 
teachers' own personal strengths right now in terms of the science curriculum and what are some of the needs. Uh, really important reflection for us as leaders because we need to make sure that the work is relevant to the teachers and it needs to start from where they are. Um, sometimes when we engage in some learning that is not um, directly connected to where they are, you can definitely have a lot more disconnection. So really important reflection to think about in terms of where your teachers are. So what is our baseline in our own classrooms in terms of science. So that might engage in some reflection around what did science look like before this new curriculum began and what does science in our classrooms look like now or what could it or should it look like now? And recognizing that everyone is in a different place. So uh, obviously we're in the uh, post-COVID new normal kind of era. Um, we need to think about uh, our staffs in terms of their learning stance and their readiness conditions to do this work. So in uh, for some of you, in some of your schools, you may be uh, on this journey um, and others really well on their way. And for some, we're just beginning the conversation because the focus at school uh, has really um, taken itself in a new direction post COVID. So um, honoring where your, your staff is, is definitely important. Uh, we also want you to think about uh, what are the learning structures that already exist in your school that is going to help facilitate some of this work? Uh, do you have some PLC models in place? Uh, perhaps divisional meetings is something that works for you. Inquiry meetings, staff meetings. Uh, I know something I use in my school is uh, something called a think tank, where I invite teachers to attend, perhaps during lunch, but uh, it's kind of non-committal. They can attend when they're free, and, and and other times they don't, which is sometimes a useful way to to engage and move the learning forward as well. Um, and finally, thinking about, uh, as Erica had mentioned earlier, what are some of the connections to uh, the work we're already doing? So uh, if we're doing work engage uh, with the new math curriculum. Let's start there. Uh, some schools are working deeply in terms of the science of reading. You can make some connections there. Is our work in, in assessment? Or we're all doing a lot of deep work in terms of our equity, diversity, and inclusion goals. Um, and that's something that can be woven uh, very authentically and appropriately as well. So uh, some food for thought just to have you thinking, and hopefully you're thinking about where your school is. And at this time, we're just going to move to the next slide because we're going to give you the opportunity opportunity to move into uh, a group that best suits your current uh, position. So if your school um, is beginning to walk this journey, we're really just at the beginning of our unpacking or unlearning of this new science curriculum. Uh, we're going to ask you to choose the group one breakout group. If your school is on the journey, so you've already, you've passed the beginning stages and you're you're already kind of working through it, but, but just not too far in, we're going to ask you to choose group two, which is on the journey. And if you're a school that's been really well engaged in this work and deeply embedded and are very well on your way, we're going to ask you to select group three. So Brad is going to uh, put up our um, choices so that you will be able to select the group you're going into. And then once the breakout session is over, we're going to move back to the large group and we're going to continue on with a few more other pieces. Sorry, how long did you want the rooms for? Uh, in terms of time, four through five, maybe I'm thinking uh, 15 minutes might be good. All right. Okay, so join your room when you see the room, group one, group two, or group three. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully you had a opportunity to engage in some dialogue with your groups. Um, so I know it was very useful for us. We're, we just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk to some colleagues and brainstorm some ideas based on kind of where your next steps are. So hopefully that was useful. Um, if I could get you, Lisa, to just move to the next slide. Um, wanted to just have a conversation and engage a little bit around some of uh, the work related to equity, diversity, and um, and thinking about how can principals uh, engage in some meaningful dialogue with staff around um, 
this important area. Uh, it is it is uh, it is part of the um, the background of the science curriculum. It is woven throughout the science curriculum and and very intentionally and is a significant part of moving this work for forward and uh, a significant part of of the why behind some of the revisions in the science curriculum. So from a principal's perspective, uh, engaging in some of the uh, in some conversation with colleagues around uh, these conversations are important, but also can be difficult. So we wanted to kind of plant an, an idea around, you know, how are we building uh, the uh, spaces for us to have these conversations with staff? And we really are trying to move away from just working through a safe space and moving towards a brave space. So sometimes when we we try to build the safe space, it, it becomes very comfortable, but when things are very comfortable, it doesn't always move us forward. Uh, when we talk about creating a brave space, we talk a little bit more about creating a space in which uh, we can become comfortable uh, in the discomfort that occurs when we engage in new learning, in any new learning, but especially when we're confronting our own like personal biases, our own personal stereotypes or roadblocks to some of our own growth. Um, so some of that conversation uh, can be woven through uh, uh, some of the professional learning that we engage in. Um, but what we can do is we can do it for, in the context of science. So we're all doing this work. We're all engaged in this in our own schools. But we can have these conversations in the context of science um, in order to kind of move the science forward, but also in the context of, of the EDI conversation. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, Lisa. Um, we wanted to share this with you uh, as a little bit of a practical framework that you might be able to use with your own staff in terms of having some of those conversations. So uh, you will be given um, a document that has a link to a number of resources that we've collated for you. This is one of them, which will be included in the link. This uh, doc, this tool comes from the K2I Academy uh, that Lisa Cole works in. Uh, it came out of the work that they were engaged in as they were preparing for de-streamed work in grade nine classrooms. The document itself is called Creating Student-Centered Learning Cultures, um, and it has many, many sections or components to it. This is one of them. Oh, thanks for putting the, the link in there, Lisa. This is one of them. There are many. So you can choose any of the ones that make sense for you. This one's called Becoming a Culturally Responsive Educator with Differentiated Instruction and Universal De Design for Learning. And what we're, what we're suggesting that you can possibly use this for is this would be the framework for the conversation. So sometimes when we have a tool uh, that we can use to guide the conversation, it's, it's a nice place to anchor the work. So if you take a look at um, the section here called Desire to Make uh, a Difference. So this particular one is about how can we as educators make a difference in this work. Um, it has four different prompts and you can look at the four different prompts um, in the context of science. So for example, just to give you an example of what this might look like, the first prompt is, I am an agent of change. So think pair share with your teachers, for example. Uh, I am an agent of change in science. What does that look like? And what are some conversations that you can have? And, and just to give you an example, it, that might involve thinking about how, you know, I as a teacher um, play a role in what happens in science. And I make very intentional decisions in terms of my science lessons, the resources I choose, and that contributes towards me as an agent of change. How are we doing? Uh, collecting some data and some monitoring. Are we in the beginning of this journey, emerging in this journey, or propelling forward in this journey? Um, and that's, again, conversations in the spaces you've created with your teachers. I identify barriers that students and families face in my learning space. What does that look like in science? So for example, as a teacher, am I looking at my IEPs to ensure that uh, I, uh, I don't have any roadblocks set up that I'm able to uh, make this, the learning accessible to everyone in, in the science lessons? Uh, third one, I actively work to dismantle barriers for students and families. Um, as a teacher, that might sound like, how can I open up the task to reach all my learnings, learners? If I'm using a specific software, for example, uh, to complete an engineering task, do all of my kids have access to the software at home? Do they have access to a computer? And finally, the fourth one there is I create a classroom culture that benefits all students. So again, some of the conversation might involve 
uh, questions such as, you know, how am I building a collaborative culture? Like what needs to happen in my classroom for my students so we get to know each other um, before kids go into teams and start collaborating and engaging in a task? So just a, a sample framework that you might want to consider using with your staff uh, to try and kind of immerse yourself in some of that EDI uh, conversation that we're having. And uh, moving to the next slide, just so also wanted to connect with you in terms of, you know, as an administrator, you know, we are constantly visiting classrooms and having conversations and trying to determine if what we're doing is making a difference. So how are we going to know that we are successful uh, in, in moving forward um, some of the new components of the science curriculum? And uh, just a, a very common suggestion. This came up in my breakout group as well. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Thinking about the, what does it look like? What does it sound like? And what does it feel like? And taking your staff, for example, and co-constructing anchor charts around this using the science curriculum. Because what you're doing is you're doing this as a model for what the teachers will do to co-construct those anchor charts with their own kids. So again, bringing it back to the context of science. What does it look like in science? Um, I'm just going to go through a couple quickly just for sake of time, because I know we're we're running out of time. But, you know, what does it look like with this new curriculum? You should be hearing things like hands on, uh, collaborating, redoing and retrying. Um, what does it sound like? You're going to want to hear dialogue. You're going to want to hear questioning. You're going to want to hear, you know, pauses to do thinking in this type of science uh, classroom. And what does it feel like? We just talked about the equity, diversity, inclusion component, that feeling of belonging, the feeling of respect, the feeling that uh, I can contribute and I see myself. So those are examples of how we can use just a co-construction of anchor charts as an example. And when we walk through classrooms, we can look for them. Um, but we also wanted to suggest that you that we definitely try to go beyond the anchor charts. Um, in other words, what are some other ways that we can see that this work that we're doing in science is making a difference? Um, so for example, if we're spending a lot of time you know, working through STEM and STEM conversations, um, might we see more extracurricular clubs, for example, pop up in terms of um, that focus? Will you see coding? Will you see robotics if you didn't have them before? So again, look, lots of different ways to try and monitor this work, but the monitoring component is definitely an important part uh, of our role as administrators. Um, so hopefully those ideas can also give you some, um, some things to think about. And I'm going to pass it off to Lisa. Yeah, this will be pretty fast. Um, there is a link to uh, a set of resources. Um, this document, uh, our team here has been uh, updating on a regular basis as we've been delivering some of these uh, learning sessions and webinars. And so we do have uh, links to past sessions, as well as a variety of links to resources made by a variety of organizations. Stale was previously mentioned, but we also have Science North. Um, and we also have uh, the collaborative work between Octi and Stale, Let's Talk Science, Canada Learning Code. And then uh, a lot, um, for as you're at, you may choose to use parts of this uh, slide deck at some point. So I've also included here references to where all the data comes from. Um, some interesting articles on racism and bias in science and, and uh, in our history um, and a variety of ad additional resources that were already mentioned. So that is all available in that shared document. Thank you. And that uh, does bring us to a close. We we tried really hard. Looks like we got you till five o'clock because we, we do respect your time and are so grateful uh, that you took the time to join us today. And we know you have a very, very busy day and very um, busy schedule. So we really appreciate it. I just want to take this time to say thank you to uh, my co-facilitators, Erica Gillespie, Lisa Cole myself, Jennifer Vieira, and we also want to thank um, our uh, beautiful coordinators who are so supportive along the way, Luciana Cartarelli from CPCO, Lawrence DeMeyer from OPC, and are also our friends at ADFO who are, are presenting separately. Um, we are going to connect ourselves and talk about our breakout groups because we're always interested in seeing how we can support you further. Uh, so thank you you so much for participating today, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or, or comments you want to share. Awesome work. Well done, everyone. Thank you. What a great and thank you. Thank you to our interpreters as well, Sandra and Anissa. Thank you.